Brown Antichinus. You've heard of casual s before, but what about competitive online rank where your high score is how many women you get to sleep with? With the Brown Antichinus, the males and females are only open for business once in their lives in something known as semiliparity. So whenever the breeding season starts, this little marsupial found in parts of Australia goes into a mating frenzy that is so intense and strong that once they're done, they just literally die due to sheer exhaustion. During the breeding season, which lasts a couple of weeks, the males, knowing that the fate of their species lies on their shoulders, will mate as much as physically possible, with them taking their job so seriously that they'll have with multiple other females around the clock, mating for up to 14 hours per day every single day for the few weeks of the breeding window. As you can imagine, this intense mating takes such an enormous toll on the male's body that it sends their stress levels through the roof. Because if having to please one woman as a human is hard, what about ten separate women in one week who need to have a baby? Their little bodies become completely depleted of nutrients and energy reserves. Their fur starts falling out in patches. Eventually, their immune systems just crash, leaving them vulnerable to hemorrhaging and rampant bleeding internally. By the time the season is over, about 7 out of 10 males just drop dead. Death by sex. Water Striders now, unknown to many, but the male water strider is quite possibly the biggest asshole in nature, to the point where they have had to literally evolve defenses against other male striders. So instead of the male evolving a better personality or just being a better guy, the horny male evolved ways to bypass the female's defenses. When the mating season arrives, a male water strider will spot a female and relentlessly pursue her, tapping her with his long legs and even shoving other males out of the way. If the female isn't interested or tries to escape, the male will latch onto her back, essentially holding her captive. The male will then begin shoving his tremendous genitalia into the back of the female's body repeatedly. The female will do everything she can to dislodge him, including swimming in frantic circles. Now at this point, the male decided that he deserves to get laid, as why not? He's a charming young water strider who needs some action, and the woman is just being stubborn. So he's willing to play literal Russian roulette in the hopes of getting some action. If the male sees that she isn't cooperating, he'll start tapping on the water to break the surface tension, alerting the fish in the water of their presence. So now the female has a choice to let him win or die. If the female still refuses, he pins her down until the last moment and flies away when the fish comes to eat her. Otters. For an animal as cute as these guys, you wouldn't think that the males engage in literal and bestiality of other animals. During mating season, male sea otters form a raft by holding hands and floating together in the water. When a fertile female swims by, the males try to herd and corral her into joining their raft. The male who successfully keeps the female in the raft gets to mate with her. If they were humans, they'd probably say things along the lines of, hey baby, stay a while and join our party raft. Don't be shy, we promise we're all gentle otters. But that's an ideal situation. Understandably, female otters have standards for mates, and may choose to reject the otter who has the sense to kidnap her. And like any male in the wild, otters do not like rejection, and will basically throw a tantrum and wonder why they aren't good enough for the woman. But instead of going back to the gym and coming with flowers on the next date, Male sea otters will kidnap and hold females in their rafts for weeks, constantly attempting to mate even when the female is not receptive. If he doesn't get his way, they start holding the females down in the water and biting on her face and nose until she complies, and if she doesn't, he'll hold her down until she dies. Even then, that still isn't enough for some male sea otters as they've been known to mate with the dead body of the female for days at a time. Only after it starts rotting is when they discard it. Clownfish If we were all reincarnated as clownfish after our favorite movie Finding Nemo, first of all, we'd all be born as males, as clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites, meaning they can change sex during their lifetime. Now. We'd be born in hundreds, and we'd have to fight each other off and compete until one male became the most dominant fish in the shoal. So let's say you become this dominant alpha male. In any other animal species, you'd have the chance to sleep with all the females in the group. But we now have a problem as we are all men, and breeding season is approaching soon. Because you're the most dominant male in our group, 
your body would now change to become a female. You'd mate with the second most prominent male in the group, and you'd lay the eggs. When you, as the dominant female clownfish, die, your husband becomes the now dominant male and will then change sex through a biological transformation and become the new female leader of the group. Rinse and repeat until we all die, and a new generation comes over to replace this generation. Giraffes Let's start with the necking behavior that male giraffes engage in. Now, if it's breeding season, two males will literally use their long necks as weapons, violently swinging them back and forth, trying to land blows on each other with their ossicones, skull protuberances, and heads. This intense necking can go on for hours, resulting in the loudest, most thunderous strikes you'll hear in nature. If you ever do hear two giraffes going at it, it's like two cannons shooting. Now, once a male has established his dominance and all the females see that he is now the biggest and strongest one around, he takes a page from the human kink book. With a lot of herbivores in the wild, they usually go around smelling women's urine in heat in their area. Let's call this method piss tender. From the smell alone, animals can detect if she's ready and fertile to mate. But the thing is, the other animals smell it in places she's already peed, so they take a mental note and swipe right or left. For the male giraffe, he likes things a bit more closer. The male will approach the female from behind and start licking and nudging her fertile region with his extraordinarily long tongue to prompt her urination. When she does urinate, the male will then promptly drink up her urine stream to detect if she's ready to mate based on her reproductive hormones. If she is, he'll rest his head and neck over her body and get into position for copulation while doing a strange back-legged mating walk around her. You might think that giraffes do this because they cannot bend down to sniff urine on the floor, but that isn't true. They do it quite often to eat plants off the ground. The male giraffes really do just like golden showers. Praying mantises. You've probably heard of this one. So it's mating season and you are a praying mantis male. Nature has programmed you to know that you have a duty to the species and you go out to look for a female. Luckily enough, you find a female who's much larger than you, by the way, and you start with an elaborate courtship dance and approach the larger female. You stroke and caress the female's body and wings in order to get her receptive to mating. Even with this, there's a 50-50 chance that if she's not interested, she will lash out and attack you. But let's say the female is impressed by your little dance and allows copulation. You get excited and go behind her to mate. The thing is, in up to 28% of cases, once the mating is underway, the larger female will simply spin her head around 180 degrees and bite off the head of her partner in the act of something called sexual cannibalism. However, even if this were to happen to you, the decapitated male mantis remains attached and programmed to continue mating and inseminating the female, even while being consumed bite by bite, as you're already too lost in the sauce. In some cases, the female doesn't just stop at decapitation. She may continue feeding by ripping off and eating one of the male's front legs or wings, while the whole time you're still relentlessly mating until completion in a half-devoured state. Earwig mites. Let's try to visualize their mating scenario. So, a guy and gal go home together after a hot date night. Instead of the usual mating, the dude just injects his seed directly into her body cavity like some sort of biological syringe. Not only that, but his swimmers then go rogue and start migrating all through her body's inner systems and tissues. Her whole form basically becoming one giant organic womb for thousands of children. But instead of the normal way children are born, they begin to violently burst out of the mother's body. This is what happens during mating when the male pierces the female's body with a huge syringe-like structure that makes up around one-third of his total body length. He then injects a giant sperm packet directly into her body cavity, completely bypassing her uterus. Now, instead of going where it usually does in other animals, the sperm migrates and spreads throughout the female's body, traveling in the fluid between her organs and tissues. Even then, once the mites hatch from these ruptured holes, they don't just leave their mother's body. They actually stick around, feeding on her nutrient fluids and tissues in a process called matrophagy, or mother eating. The tiny offspring consume the mother from the inside out over two to three days until she dies from the structural damage. Porcupine 
As usual, it starts with the males engaging in intense fights and battles over available females during the breeding season. Using their quills and teeth, the males will attack each other viciously, with most of the males dying before ever giving up a chance to mate with the female just standing there and seeing another porcupine die. Once the bloody and bruised male has won over a female, he covers his prize in urine, showing other males that he has fair game to her. When they finally attempt to mate, the female assumes a frozen stance on the ground. The male then has to do the porcupine dance. He prances, circles, and even sometimes flips over the female repeatedly before positioning himself for copulation from the rear. Now, if you've ever seen a porcupine, you know that these guys are covered in a ball of extremely painful quills. The male, who has literally fought to the death for her, has to achieve penetration. The male essentially has to force his way through the dense layer of sharp quills covering the female's backside. The whole time, the male has to hope that nothing is around to scare the female, as even the slightest scare will make all the quills pierce his soft stomach. Once mated, the pair are left stuck together, quill to quill, for up to an hour or more due to the barbed nature of the quills. They have to endure this agonizing situation, covered in each other's blood from all the quills piercing their skin. Flatworms, planarians. If humans were like flatworms, a normal breeding season would include a group of guys with the ability to change sexes when they wanted, as they are hermaphrodites. Now, if two of them were to mate, they'd try to inseminate each other at the same time. We'd line the lineup together with the heads pointing in opposite directions. Once joined, they'd twist their bodies in a behavior called penis fencing, or just penis jousting, which really does sound what it's like. So basically, two guys, penises in hand, would have to use these penis-like structures to quite literally fence, duel, and joust against each other. The goal is to stab or inject sperm into the other worm's body cavity for internal fertilization. The loser now has to become the female, carry the eggs of the other male, and lay his eggs. After all this, they produce a thick, gel-like secretion that is injected into their partner to seal up the genital pore, essentially corking the other worm to prevent any other males from fertilizing them later. Anglerfish Just like some other animals, female anglerfish can grow over 60 times larger than the dwarf males of the same species. For some weird evolutionary reason, the tiny males are born without the ability to eat or feed themselves. When one of these miniature beta male anglers finds a female, he's drawn in by her glowing lure like a moth to a flame. But instead of just mating, the male bites down on the female's body and releases enzymes that basically fuse them together permanently. From that point on, the male becomes nothing more than a hunk of functioning testes, providing a constant supply of fresh sperm for the female, a permanently fused mobile sperm bank at the point, basically. His body is essentially digested and integrated right into her tissue and bloodstream. Some anglerfish females will have multiple dwarf male husbands fused all over their bodies in this parasitic way. Others have one main sperm-providing male with the smaller ones fighting savagely to try and replace him if he's removed. The fused males can become so intertwined with the female that their bodies and biological systems become controlled by her hormone signals. They literally lose all autonomy and exist solely as mobile sperm banks to inseminate the female over and over. Once their use as sperm banks is over, they are quickly replaced by another pair of balls that soon attach to the female anglerfish. Unless you're another mobile sperm bank to YouTube, join our Discord link for more bizarre mating rituals.